Christianity is a religion that, from its beginning, was meant to be spread. In fact, to be a follower of Jesus. His intimate 12 were called apostles, and the word apostle itself means to be sent. There is a certain outgoing evangelical mission that is built right into the nature of Christianity, to go out and share the good news. But that kind of begs the question, then, if we're supposed to go out and share the good news, well, what is the good news? Early on in the church, they, they started to distinguish the preaching that was about essentially the, the nutshell message of good news and distinguish that from preaching about, well, here are the laws and here's how to live. And they use two different Greek words. The nutshell version of the gospel is called the kerygma. And the nuts and bolts of how to live it and how to do it is called the didache. Now, when you think of Christianity and especially Catholicism, I think a lot of times we tend to focus on, well, the rules. It's that second part, that didache part, the teaching part. This is what you need to do. This is when you go to mass. This is when you go to confession. This is what you sin at. This is what you don't do. Okay, all that's important, but none of that matters if it doesn't flow from that kerygma, that beautiful proclamation of the good news. All of us need to be in touch with, well, what is that Charisma. How could I share the good news right now with someone who did not know Jesus or had heard about Jesus, but maybe didn't know him very well? What would you say? What would be your sharing of the good news? Well, in our gospel today, Jesus tells us a pretty good version of the nutshell. He says it is written that the Christ would suffer and that he would rise from the dead on the third day. And then this other little part, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. So if you really had to just nail the good news down to a bullet point, it's that God came to save us. He died for us so that we could live. And then he rose from the dead so that death would no longer have power over any of us and we could live with him forever. Christ came, he suffered, he died, and he rose. That's, that's the kerygma. Almost. There's this, there's this third little bit that gets wrapped up in it that I, I think we tend to gloss over, and that is that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all the nations. If you were to name the good news, probably some of us would think, well, you know, God came to show that he loves us, and he died, and he rose. Like, that's good. But how many of us would say that we really realize that repentance and forgiveness of sins is part of that good news? See, I, I think for a lot of us who are Christians, especially those of us who go to Mass and try to do the right things, you know, sometimes maybe we don't get in touch with enough our own brokenness and sinfulness. I know for myself, I, I have always been a big fan of divine mercy, which we celebrated last Sunday, and the fact that God is merciful, I've always been like, that's great. Yes, Jesus is so merciful, that's wonderful. I just don't ever wanna to have to need it myself. I need to be perfect. And if I need Jesus' mercy, it's because I messed up. And I don't want that. Because I want to do what God wants me to do and just do it all the time and do it perfectly. And then I know I don't need anything from God. I'm good. Well, that's not how Christians are called to live. Number one, it's not true. I do need God's mercy all the time. And the fact that I need it is not a bad thing. There, I think, is the key. We think that somehow if we're sinning, we're bad. If we're not following all the rules, well, we're, we're bad or we're not living up to expectations. All over, we get the idea that somehow to be a Christian means that we need to do it just a little bit better than everybody else. We need to be those people, as the scripture says, that our light just shines and everyone looks at us and will say, wow, they're awesome. I wanna be like them. The problem is that nobody actually does that. No one looks at someone who thinks that they're better than everybody else 
and says, wow, I want to be like that. No, we look at people who think they're better than everybody else and think like, well, they're full of themselves or I could never do that. I worry that sometimes our church, Christianity writ large, can become a sort of thing in which people default now to think that if you go to church and you're a Christian, well, that means you think you're better than everybody else. Or maybe we think we're, we're better. I'm a good person because I go to church every Sunday. Let's say that that gets it exactly backwards. We should be here this morning because we know how much we need it, how messed up and, and broken and in need of repentance that we are. See, that, that's the only way it's good news. That's why repentance for the forgiveness of sin preached to the whole world is good news if you know that you need it. But you have to be humble enough to admit, I just can't do it on my own. I'm a mess, I'm broken. And then you realize, you hear voice of God saying like, I know, duh, I, I know, I know your fallen, miserable, little broken state. I'm okay with that. In fact, as soon as you realize that's where you're at, I'm right there with my mercy to help you, to save you and lift you up. And that is what makes Christianity attractive as a place where people who know they're a mess can say, well, I fit there. There's a place to go when you know you're a mess, when you need help, when you realize you can't do it on your own and you're at the end of your rope. Christianity ought to be a place where you could go and say, there I fit. There's my home, <laughs> where a bunch of other people who admit they're sick and a mess and broken all get together every week to be nourished and fed by God. You know, think of the good news it would be if you're sick to, to hear that, well, the doctor's here, someone that can help, or a cure has been found. Well, that's only good news if you know that you're really sick. If you don't think you're sick and the doctor comes, you're like, no big deal. Oh, we found a cure for this disease. Well, I don't have, so who cares? But if you realize that not only can you not do it without God, but you're not even supposed to, now there's a chance for good news. I don't know about you, but if I were to start preaching the good news to someone, I don't know if I would start with, you're a miserable, broken, messed up sinner. It's not the best opening in my mind. It's not how I'd do it. And yet, Jesus says that's part of the good news, and we see Peter do exactly that in our first reading. How many times today, if you hear a preacher get up, do we expect that well, they're going to make us feel better, they're going to comfort us, tell us everything's basically okay, God loves you, and if you follow God, you're probably going to be rich and everything will go well. Is, is that the good news? The good news that Jesus has come so there's no more suffering. No, that, that's not true. Well, Jesus has come so there, there's no more death. Uh, no, 100% not true. Peter gets up and he says to the very people who killed Jesus, who presumably he now wants to try to convert, here is Peter's invitation to come, come be a part of us, come be Christian. The God of our fathers has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and denied in Pilate's presence when he had decided to release him. You denied the Holy and Righteous One, and you asked that a murderer be released to you. The author of life you put to death. That's, that's a tough opening. I mean, I, I don't know if that's how I'd start. But Peter knows, okay, that's the bad news. That's the bad news. That says, we all messed up. We, we done wrong, but then Peter can give the good news. But the good news is that God raised him from the dead and we're all witnesses. And I know brothers that you acted out of ignorance just as your leaders did, but God has brought good through this. Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be wiped away. And you know what? <laughs> they did. People said, Peter, we believe you. What do we have to do? Well, repent, be baptized. 
This is why I think converts make some of the, the best Catholics ever. Because if you've been Catholic your whole life, you kind of are in default mode, well, I'm basically a good person. I, I love it when people come to us and say, I, I've got to be Catholic because I'm a mess. And they come up out of the font having been baptized. And they're like, I'm free. I was, I was lost, but I'm found. I was a wretch and God saved a wretch like me. That beautiful song, Amazing Grace. If God's grace does not seem amazing like that to you, maybe it's because you haven't got in touch with just how much you need it and how much we need repentance. The Jewish leaders who Jesus is addressing some of them, or Peter is addressing some of them here, they, they thought, as some Christians do today, that especially if you're going to be a religious leader, well, then you have got to do it perfect. Your whole job as a leader is to show everybody this is how you do it. This is what a perfect life looks like. That's what the Pharisees thought. They really thought that they were perfect and that they were supposed to be perfect. Jesus had to tell them over and over, no, you're doing it all wrong. You're making it so people who are sinners don't want to come to you. I wonder if maybe we do that a little bit ourselves as Christians now. Do we try to kind of hide our weaknesses, cover them over and say, oh, I'm fine. It's all good. I'm fine. Are you the kind of person that maybe you don't even realize you're doing it, but people look at it and say like, yeah, they're just, they're just so, so good. I'm not like that. Or are you the kind of person that someone who is weak and broken and a mess would look to say, man, I know, I know John. He's a mess just like me. I bet I could talk to him. Or I know Sarah. She, I mean, she's struggling, but somehow she keeps going. How does she do it? Maybe I'm a mess too. Maybe I could talk to her. I mean, she's down to earth. She's someone that I think would get me. That's the kind of Christians we need because the truth is if we look like we've got it all together, we're just lying to ourselves and everybody else because we don't. And that's, that's not saying that, oh, we should just sin and not worry. That's what St. John says in our second reading. My children, I am writing this to you so that you may not commit sin. Okay, we should strive for that. But at the same time, John says, but if anyone does sin, meaning like, yeah, that's going to happen, then we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Do you see Jesus as your advocate, your helper, your friend when you're stuck in sin? I know I would tend to think that, well, if I'm sinning, that I'm saying, Jesus, I don't want you. So Jesus probably hates me when I'm sinning. It's not what John says. And, and John <laughs> lived life fairly perfectly. But he's like, no, if you sin, here's what Jesus thinks about you. He's going to be your advocate. He's going to help you. He's going to say, you know what? You weak, broken, messed up, miserable little sinner. I died for you precisely because I know that's your state and you can't save yourself. So it's okay. I know. I know about the brokenness. I know about the hurt. I know about all of it. So don't hide it. There's nothing more silly than a Christian trying to hide that they're weak and a sinner. When Pope Francis became Pope, one of his first interviews, they're like, well, who is Francis? It's like, well, I'm a sinner. I mean, if someone asked you, who are you? Would, would that be your first answer? And yet for Pope Francis, that was it. I'm a sinner. I hope that that would ultimately be at least somewhere in our identity is how we see ourselves. Stop trying to be perfect. Stop thinking that you're perfect, at least. And I'm preaching to myself here, too, because all the time I'm like, oh, I messed that up. God must hate me. No, no. God is from heaven. Dear little Sean, you are my messed up, broken, beloved son. I will help you. Think if we have that kind of image. Now there, there is some good news we can spread. Because this world, it's a mess. It's broken. Is our church a place where people who are messed up and broken, is this a place where people know that's where I need to go? If I cut my arm, I know I'm going to have to go to the emergency room. If I get super sick, I'm going to go see my, my counselor. If people are stuck in sin, feeling unworthy, broken, is this a place they know they can go? And maybe more importantly, are you the kind of person 
that someone who is hurting would come to because they know you would understand. I bet a lot of you are the kind of people who would understand, but maybe we think our job is to hide our brokenness. Let's stop hiding. Today, Jesus tells us that the good news is that he suffered, died, rose from the dead, and now all the miserable, broken little sinners in the world can repent and receive forgiveness of sins. That's good news, but it's only good if we realize the reality of the bad news. So be a witness today. You are witnesses of these things, St. Luke tells us at the end of the gospel. So go be a witness. Be a witness to brokenness, to inability, imperfection, sinfulness even. Be yourself, and you'll attract people here where they can find healing and forgiveness of sins.